piece you saw was made by a student a number of years ago. Um, I raised the question in class one day, uh, what is a book? And for two weeks, the students did research, they had conversations, they had lots of arguments um, as to what a book was, and then each one had to take a stand and make a short video, and this was one that was made. I will show you two others um, through the speed, through my lecture. So what is it about these objects that we call books that some of us will pay money for, spend endless hours reading them, collect them on our bookshelves, this is my office at school, erect libraries to house them and give people access to them, and passionately talk about them with friends. The title of my lecture, The Future of Books, has two important words to consider, future and books. If I'm going to discuss the future of books, then I should at least allude to the past and to the present, because without them, discussions of the future are without any basis. In discussing any topic, I find it best to start with a definition, so let's do that. This is how the dictionary defines a book. I will not read it for you because I know you can read, and I always got upset with professors who read the slides for us. I like the conciseness of this definition. It's a clear description. But we knew this already, right? Because we grew up with books. Many of us did, I hope all of us grew up with books. Whether we like them or not, we know what a book is. I'd venture a guess that everyone in this hall has at least one book at home. Some have many books. Others have too many that they all don't have a home on a bookshelf, so they sit in piles occupying corners in rooms. <laughs> the Western world has a very rich and long history of books. Even before Gutenberg's first printing of the Bible in 1455, approximately, books existed. They were made by hand, which took a very long time to produce, and which is why there weren't very many of them. These early books are a marvel to behold because of what they tell us about the production of books, certainly the history of books. They tell us about decisions made concerning the layout of a page or two pages, the proportion of text to the page, the proportion of margins to text, the typeface, the weight, the size, and color. The use of images or illumination as counterpoint to the text. The sequence of pages for smooth logical reading. And finally, the binding, the container of those pages. Those many decisions are made every time someone designs a book, even today. We can't discuss books without discussing reading. Eloquent words have been written about reading, from the science of it to the personal love of the act of reading. So let me show you this video, also made by another student in that same class.
it's easy to romanticize reading and books and the past. And we cannot discuss books without discussing the technologies that affect the book, its production, the materials and tools used, and its distribution. Printing technologies, for example, have evolved over the 550 years since Gutenberg's time. Hand operation gave way to mechanical assistance, then to almost fully automated printing with speeds that are hard to believe. Technology always had an impact on the printing, on the printed word, increasing the number of books or newspapers or magazines produced in far less time. It made the work easier, faster, and in many ways the quality was better because the paper and ink technologies were also improving. In terms of books and reading, today's technologies have definitely made an impact on the shape and delivery of books, which brings us to There's actually a rather fascinating history of the development of books delivered digitally, whether on computer screens, on e-book readers, or now tablets. One timeline says it started in around 1946. There was a heavily annotated electronic index to the works of Thomas Aquinas. And others point to 1963, the hypertext editing system from Doug Engelbart, and the file retrieval and editing system from Andreas Van Dam. But the gist of all these efforts, and there were others that came afterwards, the gist of these efforts explored ways to deconstruct content, the text, thus allowing one to search, reconfigure, annotate, and study that text. In short, to analyze the text. Being scientists and academics, they wanted to make this available to all. Content was, and this is a description, formatted dynamically for different users display hardware, window sizes, and so on, as well as having automated tables of content, indices, and so on. All these systems also provided extensive hyperlinking graphics and other capabilities. I mention this because at the heart of these efforts was a spirit of openness, which is in contrast to many efforts these days to commercial, in commercial electronic publishing where the focus tends to be on ex exclusivity and financial gain. In 1971, Michael Hart produced the first electronic copy of a text, the US Declaration of Independence. He actually typed it out, and that was the first ebook. He also started Project Gutenberg, which is still ongoing, and its goal has been to digitize books for easy distribution e electronically and for free. There is a good timeline on Wikipedia that I would recommend you look at if you're interested in this. I mention this history because this early work set the stage for subsequent explorations that led to the e-book as we know it today and e-readers and tablets that allow us to download, read, store these e-books with relative ease and comfort. So this is where we are today. We have a book on the left with a long and rich history, one that evolved over the roughly 560 years since Aldous Minutius printed it. Then we have the new kid on the block, the digital device on the right that lets us read on its screen. It is smaller than the large book on the left. It's much lighter and more portable. It's becoming more and more popular because of what it offers in convenience and ease of use. Let's look at a few factors that distinguish one from the other. These are fairly self-explanatory, but just let me briefly go through them. You have the physicality of a book versus the, vir the virtuality of the digital device. And I, I, use, I use book culture and digital culture to basically explain that we are, have been entering a digital culture now for quite a number of years but we cannot dismiss the book culture that we have been living in and building on for so many years. And I believe that we are not going to do away with book culture. I think we are going to have, we'll find a way to coexist these two cultures. 
the primary format or material, if you will, for book culture is the paper versus the screen for digital. The surface in books is static. In other words, once ink is married to paper, there is no change. The opposite is true with screens. It's a digital surface. It can be changing constantly. And that's something we have to keep in mind when we design for it. The primary elements that one works with with book culture are words and images. In digital culture, you add sound and movement. The book culture is old and established. Digital culture is young, flexible, and sexy. I grew up surrounded by book culture, loving to read books, magazines, comics, newspapers, album liner notes, LP liner notes, as well as look closely at them and admire their beauty. When I started college in the United States in 1964, I grew up in Southeast Asia, so I'm not really an American, so, sort of. Um, my design instructor opened my eyes to book design like I had never experienced before. These books that I'm gonna show you were designed by contemporary graphic designers, often with very striking photography and typography. So let me show you that are these three that I remember well so at least you can understand my perspective and my aesthetic, in a sense, where I'm coming from. This is a book that was published in 1964, the year that I started college. Black and white. Sam Haskins is a photographer. He shot images in Africa. This is the front cover, back cover. Already that made me realize I should always look at the back cover when I pick up a book, not just the front. Opening spread. This just blew my mind. Like, wow, you can have type that big and go to the edges with it? But this prepared me for what I was going to see inside. It was going to be strong. It was going to be shocking. Shocking in a good way. First spread of images. Two images, black and white, next to each other. Next spread. And then I'll show you a few sample spreads. I was struck later on, obviously, I didn't realize it as I was looking at it then, but I was struck by the way he would juxtapose shapes that were similar, but two totally different materials, natural, man-made. And then there was type at the end of the book, only at the end. And then you saw actually commentary on each of the photographs that we saw, that you just saw. That impressed me because I'd never seen anything like that before growing up. This was another book. Richard Avedon, he was still a fairly young photographer then. And James Baldwin was a fairly controversial African-American writer. 1964, I saw also when I came to the US and started college, um, my vision of the United States was that it, w and it was based on movies that I saw as a child in the 50s and early 60s, was that it was, you know, a country with big highways, big cars, um, women with blonde hair. And I knew very little about race problems. Um, I knew that the Vietnam War was beginning to get a little bit, um, was, was beginning to increase. But I started to see photographs by Avedon that looked like this, or this, or these. They were not glamorous photographs. He also does, did, sorry, he's passed away. He also did fashion photography, beautiful fashion photography. This was not fashion photography. This was almost like honest photography. Fashion is not honest. I was into the Everly Brothers then. Their harmonies were terrific. What a great photograph. These were, these were also printed in gravure. I didn't know what gravure was. My teacher explained that to me. And so the blacks were really solid black. They were just really rich blacks. And this is a spread. 
and much like the Sam Haskins book where the gutter was not an impediment of going over the gutter. Um, I learned that when you design a spread, you really look at the spread. You don't design two pages, you're really designing a spread. And this is the other book. This was a play by Ionesco. It was an absurd play, which meant it made absolutely no sense. But what, what's so amazing about the book was that um, the French typographer Massin did a typographic translation of the play with these black and white photographs. That's the cover of the book, that cover. <laughs> so your chuckle already says, hmm, something, something could be fun. Opening spread. It's a play. Next spread. Again, the strength of this and the roughness of the type prepares you for what's inside. So it says it's a little bit about a play over on the left side. And now it introduces you to the characters, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith, the Martins, the maid, and the fire chief. And you notice, or many of you, if you're designers or typographers, should notice that there's a different typeface for each actor. And he basically goes through the play. Everything that's spoken, and it talks about it's 9 o'clock, they're finished with dinner, they're sitting there. And after a while, the maid comes, and there's a knock on the door, and she introduces these guests, and the guests sit down. And they start talking, and they eventually start arguing. Now, what makes this an absurd play is that Ionesco took his dialogue from language lessons. You know, when you learn a foreign language, they give you sentences to say. And oftentimes, they're pretty silly sentences. The soup was hot today. You know? <laughs> so what was this man doing? Or you know, any of these. Anyway, that's what the play was. <coughs> But all of a sudden, I began to realize that with a spread like this, he was beginning to help us hear how the words were being spoken, that they were beginning to argue with each other, and so the lines were beginning to interrupt each other. Look at this. And this was in 64, before computers, before Photoshop, right? So he actually had the type set, and he would curve the paper and then photograph it again. So that's how he got the shape of the, of the curved text. This is great. And I was hearing, I was hearing this play, not just seeing this play, by reading this book. Fantastic. The last word. And that's the serif of the N. I love it. And then the play starts again with the same setting and the same description. I still remember those books, and I still have them, and I show them to my students because I say, I don't know if there's anything like these anymore today. There probably are, I'm, you know, I'm sure. But there was something about them. And so I, I tried to find descriptors for what it was about these books that really influenced me or that struck me. One was book as a movie, that you could, I could read this book the way you watch a movie. The interplay of word and image was so integrated. It wasn't like words were over here and images were over here. They're, this, they're, they're elements that should be interacting with each other. Compositions were dynamic as hell. I mean, there was just, you know, the, the uh, cropping of, of, um, of Avedon's photographs, you know, mm -hmm. either straight center or, you know, partially cut off. These were all large books. You know. The Avedon and the um, Sam Haskins are really large books. So now you've got real estate, you've got mass that's really strong. Beautiful printing. 
And what these books were doing, I realized much, much later on, was that they were challenging the convention of the day. That this is the way books should look. But why can't I just have photographs and then have the text at the end? But do we do that in books? And again, if you look at the history of books, there would be old books that also challenged convention 300 years ago, 200 years ago. So it's nothing really new. A few other things from that period of time that influenced me. The Marshall McLuhan and uh, designed by Quentin Fiore, The Medium is the Massage book also was very, very influential and I would encourage any of you that have not read it to read it and look at it because you have to look at it as much as read it. But I did find out as I was preparing for this lecture um, that the title, The Medium is the Massage, is actually a, is, is a typo. It's a type mistake. It really was the message because he had an essay, The Medium is the Message, um, much earlier on. And when, they, when he saw a proof of this, um, he realized it, would, it was a mistake, but it was too late to make a change. I guess they had some deadline to meet. And he just thought, oh, heck, just go ahead. It's, you know, look, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, it's like mass age, right? You know, mass age. So he thought, oh, there's still something worth keeping. Um, this is the first issue of Rolling Stone. Um, when it was still a pretty... Um, sort of underground newspaper and not slick at all like it is today. And the films um, of Charles and Ray Eames, uh, in particular I saw the preview for Powers of Ten um, in 1969 um, at the Walker Art Center and um, it was just, just amazing that it was telling a story, it was explaining a scientific actually principle um, in ways that were so clear and so convincing. And I thought, they're designers, and they did that. Um, so these were things that, that, that influenced me, not just the books, but uh, things like films and so on. And I can't leave the 60s without showing these. These were also by Richard Avedon. And these were so, again, incredibly amazing. Now it doesn't look so new, right? And that's too bad. But those of you who are close to my age probably were there when these appeared and these were like collector's items, right? But these were black and white images that he shot of the Beatles and then in the dark room messed around with, with color and with dyes. And um, they're still pretty, pretty impressive, I think. So let me shift gears a little bit and let's talk about how books are actually developed, because that will then lead into the future of books. So this is, a, I consider, a very simple development model. Someone has an idea for content. I want to write a book about cooking whatever, um, or I have a new novel that I want to write. Somebody has an idea for content. Somebody creates the content. Then somebody has to shape the content, give form to the content, and eventually someone has to deliver the content. Is it a book? Is it sold? And so on. So let me just go through a few examples. With this example, this would be a traditional book. Let's say it's a novel. So the idea for the content will probably come from the writer who speaks to the editor, right? The person who creates the content is the writer. He or she writes the novel. That text is then given to a book designer, a graphic designer, and she or he shapes the content. And eventually it's printed, bound, and shipped, and it becomes a physical book, right? It's, that's pretty clear. Let's try another example. Let's say the book, Nothing Personal, the photography book. So there's the editor, there's the writer, Baldwin, but there's also the photographer, right? The content is created by the writer and the photographer. The shaping of the content is done by the graphic designer or book designer. And delivering the content is a physical book again. Let's try a travel book. There's a travel writer who works with an editor. The content is created by the travel writer, researchers who help research all the information because oftentimes the writer can't do it all. 
There are photographers, there's probably illustrators, and there's probably cartographers because maps have to be created for this thing. So now the list of those creating the content begins to grow. It's still usually given to a designer, a graphic designer, to put together, and it's delivered as a physical book again. What if we now look at the travel book on the web? We see pretty much the same players with the exception of a web developer. She or he has to be part of the early conversations and she or he definitely have to be part of shaping the content as well. Because you can say, let's do this, this, and this, but the developer says, you know what, that can't work very well on the web, but if we do it this way, that might actually be, be better. So again, that web developer now is a key participant in this thing. And it's delivered either as a website, it could be delivered as an iPad app um, these days, but basically now you're beginning to see that this model can still work in this new arena. What if we have a person, let's say there's just an artist who says, I have an idea for the content, I'm going to create the content, I'm going to give shape to the content, and I'm going to deliver the content. And what we have are artist books. We tend to take books for granted. And we rarely, if ever, ask these kinds of questions or pay attention to the physical and visual attributes of a book. For the artist, much of the story in these books is visual. An idea may be found in the book's shape or binding, in the materials used, or in the artist's choice of images. Words may be used to reinforce a message, but they're not always essential to the book's message. The physicality of the book is as much about the message as the content itself. The whole package, the book, the medium, is the message. Let me show you some examples of artist books. Because I think these are a nice example of artists challenging the most basic assumptions of a book. What is a book? What are pages? What is a cover? What is binding? These are from a collection that we have in our library at, at my school, and I just uh, picked a few to, to photograph. So this is in a slipcase. You pull the slipcase out. It looks like a pretty conventional book, but when you start opening the page, you begin to see different shapes, and when you open it up, the book sort of opens up like a flower, and you can read through the pages. This is another book. It's called Emily's Apple. And actually, the poem is an Emily Dickinson poem. So you have a wooden apple which you open up and there is a curl of paper inside. You take it out and unfold it or un unroll it and you begin to read the poem. And actually you can see the poem a little bit at the base of the apple. They shut me up in prose as when a little girl, etc., etc. They put me in the closet, etc. Is this a book? These cut shapes, multiple shapes, sizes, interact with each other as you open this book. This is a book called The C Word, That C Word, and it's about a woman with cancer. And the, the pages are made of coffee filters. And inside the coffee filter is a page, like you see in the lower left, with part of the poem on there. So those are pages. It's bound with one sort of bolt or screw, coffee filters, pages inside or sections inside. Is this a book? It kind of looks like a book. This is a fairly large one, and it's really quite an impressive one, um, especially when you start unfolding it. 
because you begin to see these dimensional shapes that begin to emerge. And I took some close-ups. And it's a beautiful, it's a luscious, it's beautifully produced book, beautifully printed, beautifully cut, folded, and so on. And then this is the reverse of the book. There, there's text, there's image, there are, you could call them pages in between the folds. Is this a book? And I want to show you this to you for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because of its idea. Um, and the idea is this. This is a Bible um, that was commissioned by a, a group of Benedictine monks that also have a school in Minnesota in the, in the US. And they were coming, we were coming to the end of the 20th century and they asked themselves, is there something that we can make or have made for us that almost as a gift to the new century. And the Benedictines, as you know, have a very long and rich history um, in, in the church, in religion. But documents, old documents, is certainly very much part of their culture. And so they hired or they worked with Donald Jackson, who is in the upper left, image who is the scribe, the official scribe to the Queen of England and said, would you like to work with us and actually hand write a new Bible? So use some old technology, some new technology, but make a Bible for the 21st century, but paying homage to the tradition of how books were made. So he put together a team of eight scribes, and I think it took them something like 12 years, but um, it's finished, it's just recently finished. Um, and you can see the size, it's really quite imposing. Donald did most of the images or the, or the illuminations, um, but you can see in the far right upper picture, they used quills, I mean real quills, they worked on vellum. Um, and. You can see the picture of the monk on the lower left, just you can get a sense of the size of it. But the illustrations, the images, have definite references to the 20th and 21st century. So you will see images, um, let's say scientific um, discoveries that are shown in symbols or views, I think there's one of the, the famous photograph taken from the moon of the Earth, of the planet of Earth. I mean, certainly back in Gutenberg's day, that would have been a dream. Um, so he incorporates those into his, into his images. Um, but I find it to be a really fascinating project because of that mix of tradition and a new, if you will, a new sensibility. The other thing that, I mean, this is sort of a, a side story to it, but I went to college at St. John's, so it's, you could say it's, it's, it's meaning, a little more meaningful to me because that's my alma mater. So this was something that Marshall McLuhan wrote back in the 60s. We're just trying to fit the old things into the new form. Is that what's happening here? If you look at, this is the New Yorker, it's a magazine in the States. You can see the magazine and you can see it on the iPad. Kind of looks the same, right? So is this a new book? Or is this, a, is this a, just a replica of an old book? This is a, <clears throat> an animated story on the iPad. But doesn't it look like <clears throat> a book <clears throat> with the text below? <clears throat> what makes it different is that you can touch the screen or you can swipe the screen and things happen. So you can swipe it and the wind blows and blows the papers around and so on. I mean, it's, it's fun, it's entertaining. <clears throat> but it feels like it wants to be, it wants to look like a book. And this is the New York Times online 
which has done all it can to look like the New York Times newspaper. Readers feel assured that this is the New York Times because it looks just like the Times, but that's also part of the brand of the New York Times. So the decision for a conventional look and feel were very consciously made. Question is, is this a cop-out? Is this an easy way out? Well, if it gives readers assurance, you can argue, then that's good because they'll come back and read again another day. But what's interesting is that if you scroll down, this is just the, the top part, if you scroll down, you realize that this is a very long scroll and actually a very complete table of contents for this issue. Here's a better way to look at it. That's the whole page, basically. It's well organized, clearly presented, and actually very accessible. This is a departure from the newspaper and a measured exploration into information on screen. The New York Times is not going to do anything really wacky because they're the New York Times, right? But they understand what the technology offers and says, well, wait a minute, we can just continue with this scroll. We can have the entire contents in one scroll rather than having to go from page to page. So this is no longer paper with the constraints of the physical page. Virtual space is endless. So maybe we should start exploring that aspect of it. This is something that someone recently sent me, and this is actually um, a whole um, explanation for um, responsive and adaptive typography so that depending upon the size of your screen, is it an iPhone, is it, or a smartphone, is it an iPad, is it a computer screen, the type knows how to behave and how to grow in size in relation to that screen. So you don't have to tell it, the type knows what to do. This is all done with software, obviously, right? When designers take advantage of what new technology offers, then there is a chance for innovation. But much depends on the mindset and the intent of those designing content for these new devices, like e-readers and tablets and even smartphones. One direction is towards conventional solutions, the most obvious being a straight copy of the paper page. The other direction is similar to thinking to the artist books building on convention while exploring new content, new forms, new motion, and new interaction. Many examples exist, and I'm sure you've seen some of them. The degree of new, maybe even crazy thinking is really up to those creating it. It takes an open mind combined with technological knowledge because the marriage of great ideas and expert technical support produces memorable results. I think you have to have the two now. You cannot not know about technology. Here's a very simple and enjoyable iPad app that someone showed me very recently. It's called Fish, a Tap Essay. And it's based on tapping the screen to move to the next part of the monologue. It's only type. There's one image at the very end, but it's only type. And when you've read it, you tap and it goes to the next thing. When you read it, you go to the next one and so on. So you control the reading in the same way you control reading a page. Okay. There's no moving type, strong color, or visual tricks, just words on the screen. But the monologue is very well written. And that's what keeps me reading like a good book. I became interested, actually, in the person who created it, a woman by the name of Robin Sloan, and found that she's authored and designed earlier online stories. This was her first one. Actually, it became so popular that now a publisher is actually going to print a physical book of it, which is a little bit ironic. This was another one. I'll let you read that.
So even the way she begins to describe it is a little bit tempting, right? Tells you what's there. Okay, scroll on. You know, it's 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 a, it's a nice a nice invitation. And she's she's very informal like that, even in the even in the tap story. It's it's quite nice. Do you see the top line there? Hi, I'm Robin Sloan. Okay, keep that in mind because I'm going to come to that again. So this, you know, these are some screens, but you can begin to see in the right hand that it's really a long scroll again. So there's really no need for pages. You don't even have to s talk about pages. She writes conventional stories. They really are pretty conventional stories, but explores the iPad or the web for new ways to present it. Robin used the term media inventor, remember that, to describe herself. And here's what she writes about it. Do you notice a similarity in this description to a topic we discussed earlier? Artist books? When she says, media inventors feel compelled to make the content and the container. She's describing an attitude that inspired those artists to create books without constraints of tradition. She is using current technology to create new formats for her stories in the same way web designers at the New York Times are stretching the definition of an online newspaper. Take a break and show you one last. comes down to the interdependence of content and form. One really cannot exist without the other. Good content will always win the day. It always has. But with the emergence of new technologies and new platforms, creative form will also be necessary. And this is what I'm most interested in watching over the next few years. When some of these alternate paths for form are explored, with no preconceived idea of the results, wonderful accidents and discoveries may happen. 
It's a mindset that allows this to happen. The attitude of people like John Cage and Brian Eno, where chance plays a major role in decision making, excites me. It did when I was a uh, student and it still does now. Or the attitude of Koi Van, who used to be art director for the online New York Times, who suggests that e-readers are fine for reading book content, but tablets like the iPad are really about accessing all kinds of content, not just words. Don't let the publishing industry define content and form for us. I expect we may see people from disciplines beyond design trying out ideas that come closer to performance than printing, closer to movies than books. I believe books will continue to exist, less on the cheap end and more on the well-produced and expensive end. Taking their place alongside ebooks, audiobooks, iPad, tablets, smartphones, and who knows what else. Let paper, printing, and binding do what they have done so well for, the, for over 500 years, but let there continue to be exploration even in that area. Likewise, explore digital media and emerging platforms for what they offer, and explore the intersection of content and form in this growing area. This quote by Elizitsky is a strong statement about the need for change in all quarters, not just books. True exploration is usually driven by personal conviction and curiosity, and I hope this is true for many of you. The new writers he refers to will not necessarily come from the usual areas of book publishing, but from media inventors, as Robin Sloan said, from tinkerers, dreamers, and explorers, those with curiosity, open minds, and a good narrative. On a blog exchange I read, if, auth if, an, if authors begin thinking of themselves as software engineers, they'll see entirely new ways to use the device for storytelling. Interactive novels, novels with bits of video and sound embedded like a web page a movie that plays in the top of the screen with notes below to read. Just a few examples. My intent today was to raise questions and pose a few answers. I don't think actually anyone has an answer as to what the future of books is. And I hope that dialogue may follow, whether it happens in your studios, in your classrooms, in your libraries, kitchens, and coffee shops. This is how change happens. Thank you.